All right. Aloha, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on innovation in Hawaii for the next 10 years. I'm Shanoa Farnsworth. I'm the managing partner at Blue Startups. And I'm going to start, hopefully, by showing you a little video. Wish me luck, because <laughs> I'm going to need it. All right. Let's see. Let's see. I'm already, I'm already failing in this search. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, interesting. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe you don't want to play later. I don't know. You're doing great. <laughs> Ikaika. Thank you, Ikaika. Thanks for watching. <laughs> watching me flail around as usual. All right. Well, um, okay, I'm going to try one more time. Can't give up so, so, so soon. Okay. You guys see my screen? Yeah. Hopefully. All right, cool. Good. We're going to try this. <laughs> Did you see your logo in there? I did. I was. I, was I know like, yeah. you're one of our Going star players. Yeah. You're one of our star players. All right. So, for those of you who don't know about Blue Startups, it is a venture accelerator here in Honolulu, Hawaii, and we are recruiting for cohort 14. So get your applications in. The deadline is April 1st. Our next cohort will run this summer. It'll be a hybrid program: six weeks here in Honolulu, six weeks online, and one week in San Francisco. Uh, this will be our 14th cohort. We've been at it now for nine years. We've invested in 99 companies, one of which went public last year. Yay, Volta Charging. If you're familiar with that company, if you're from Hawaii, you may have seen their charging stations around town. And we invest up to $100,000 into each company, put them through this rigorous three-month mentor-driven process here in the Blue Startups headquarters. So we look forward to seeing all your applications come in. And without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our panel or have them introduce themselves so that I don't mess it up. Uh, so I'll start with Asaf. Please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Asaf Carmon. I'm the CEO of Turnover BNB. We're a vacation rental operations platform and we help uh, property managers and cleaners get together and be able to you know, make a living. Uh, we operate all over the world in all 50 states, um, but we're headquartered here in Honolulu. We have an office here downtown um, and we're actively recruiting uh, marketing professionals. If you're interested, please reach out to me. All right, like most startups, always, always recruiting and a soft uh, turnover BNB went through Blue Startups. Uh, I think, what cohort was it? 10, 11? 10. 10, cohort 10. That was a couple of years ago. So they're one of our uh, shining examples of what you can do with a, a little money guidance and a lot of hard work. Um, so really proud of Turnover BNB. All right. Uh, next, um, Ryan, go ahead and introduce yourself. Good afternoon from uh, Noah Valley. My name is Ryan Ozawa. Um, one of my titles is CEO of Smart Yields, which went through uh, Blue Startups in cohort six. And uh, longtime fan of Shinoa, big fan of Asafs as well. Um, basically a longtime observer, cheerleader, and occasional participant in Hawaii's innovation ecosystem. Um, right now, I have just started my own uh, life as a 
uh, independent entrepreneur after working in a day job my entire life since uh, 1997. So it's very, very exciting to finally try to put up or shut up and do all of the things that Shanoa tried to, tries to teach everybody how to do. But um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, next, I'll have uh, Ilihia introduce himself, but just real quick program note. John DeFries, who was scheduled to be here today, got pulled into a Ways and Means Committee hearing at the legislature. So if you don't know what that means, those are the folks who the control the, the budget for HTA. So a little more important than talk in story with us here today. So, uh, but thankfully, Elihia was available and can join us. So I'll have him introduce himself now. Aloha kako. My name is Elihia Johnson. I'm the Public Affairs Officer at the Hawaii Tourism Authority. Um, you know, John sends his aloha to all of you. He, as Shanoa said, he is uh, over at the legislature. And I am so happy to be here with you to talk innovation. It's something that's exciting for me personally. Um, you know, I, I had a period in my life as an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm here back in public service for a brief time now. And uh, looking forward to the conversation. So mahalo nui. Awesome. All right. So very excited to have our panel. I'll be asking them a few questions and then we'll open it up to the audience to ask questions. So do be thinking of questions that you have for the panelists. So our first question is around how we think the innovation ecosystem here has changed. The environment has changed due to COVID. You know, our whole uh, world got turned upside down a couple of years ago. And so, you know, the question on the table is what has changed for Hawaii's innovation ecosystem as a result of that? Um, Asaf, we'll start with you, how about? I, I would say that um, it has actually changed in a very pos positive way. So I think pre-COVID, a lot of the seed money um, was very local. So you had to actually be in the same market as the investors that you were courting. And I think this kind of a transition to you know, working remotely, investing remotely um, has unlocked a lot of these barriers. So I think uh, you know, a company that's looking for seed money right now in Hawaii is not just limited to you know, the local investors, which I love uh, and has been very supportive to me, but it would have been a lot you know, easier if I had access to, to you know, seed capital all over the world. And I think people are kind of changing their mindset. They're not just investing in their backyard. So I think from that perspective, it has been, um, it's been huge. Uh, another thing that is positive is the transition to remote work. Um, you know, companies that are headquartered here uh, will have to be kind of distributed or partly remote just because there isn't enough talent to bring everyone under one roof. Um, and because the whole world is, is starting doing business this way, you're no longer handicapped um, and you're kind of competing on the same terms as people on the mainland. Um, on the other hand, um, if you are looking for local talent, you're now competing with all the employers in the world mm. as opposed to you know, the local employers. So I think it's been a mixed bag, but overall, very positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point, Asaf. I think the old rule of thumb used to be that, you know, venture capitalists wouldn't invest anywhere that wasn't within a block of their office. I mean, literally, you know, or driving distance at the very least. And that has definitely changed. It's been a slow change over years, but this has really solidified the change, I think. You know, the, the, the whole remote work and COVID situation, yes, investors are investing anywhere and everywhere now. Um, and yeah, the talent issue, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of that because it is one of the things I used to say about Hawaii as an asset, right? Once you have a good employee, they don't have a lot of other options. <laughs> so they're more likely to stay put, you know, because one of the things that happens in Silicon Valley is that people move around a lot, right? They're at Facebook for six months, then they move over to Google for six months and very hard for retention. Um, and we didn't have that problem, but it's interesting to think maybe now we do have that problem. Hmm. 
Uh, Ryan, what's your take on how things have changed? I agree with Asaf. Um, I mean, basically, the pandemic made everything theoretical real. Uh, we would always imagine of a fully distributed world, and now we've experienced it. And um, But I also really like the way that he articulated the double-edged sword. Um, I mean, I love that now, you know, even healthcare is delivered remotely. I meet with specialists in California because it doesn't matter anymore where we are. Technology has gotten to the point where it's reasonable. And in fact, everybody in the chain is comfortable. And I think that's true in venture capital and investing too. Now they've spent their entire last two years in Zoom. So why not invest in a company somewhere else? But I do agree that you know, the challenge of finding talent in Hawaii has always been pretty significant. You know, we don't have the pipeline. Um, some some uh, areas do, particularly Silicon Valley, but anywhere with, say, a really powerful university putting out um, CE and engineering um, graduates by the bucket load. Um, so I agree that the, the downside is that Hawaii businesses will uh, compete for talent with Facebook and <laughs> Apple. And that seems like an almost insurmountable um, challenge. But on the other hand, I think when you look at it from the worker perspective, this is so exciting. And I've seen this firsthand um, here in our community, which is you now, uh, well, okay, Apple and Facebook are kind of calling everyone back to the office now, but you, know, you had these opportunities to get good paying technology jobs while living in Hawaii because they also were used to having a distributed workforce. So when I think about competing in that way, you know, Hawaii might not be able to pay a software developer what um, a Silicon Valley firm might, but that's where I think, and I think Iliahi will speak to this in particular, there are things that cannot be replicated outside of Hawaii, that is many things that are only here in Hawaii, and those are the things that I think that we're going to find uh, we're able to ex uh, not exploit very bad word, but be able to capitalize on and and you know use to our advantage. Because if you can work anywhere, why wouldn't you work here? And our Hawaiian culture, our Hawaiian weather, our Hawaiian uh, uh, climate can't be replicated either. So there are advantages we can still take take. Yeah, definitely true. We can't you can't replicate what we've got. There's no possible way. You know, when we started Blue Startups, we were talking about startup paradise, right? And and that uh, idea really took hold around the world. We were known as startup paradise. I actually was on a panel once, which pitted me against a person from a startup per ecosystem person from Israel and a startup ecosystem person from the south of Spain. And the question was. Where's the real startup paradise? And I was like, this is a question. We're in Hawaii, people. You can't compete. There's no way. So yeah, we have that hands down. Um, on the remote work thing, I think just an interesting note about Hawaii's people working remotely, which I do think is a big opportunity for us. And in fact, one of our companies, one of the Blue Startups companies, Instant Teams, is working with program with DBED right now to retrain Hawaii people so that they can qualify for these remote jobs um, and hopefully stay here and enjoy our lifestyle here, but get paid those mainland wages, which is kind of nice to think about. Ilhia, what do you think? What has changed here in the pandemic? Oh, thanks for the question. I think the most important thing that changed and you know, the entrepreneurs in the crowd are gonna appreciate this, was the removal of status quo, right? Because the, the scariest part of starting something on your own is leaving the comfort of what you know. So when we look at the pandemic, it shifted everything that we know, right? It, it took us all out of our comfort zones. And I think for, for the innovation space, that's a wonderful thing because that's where the innovation happens, right? When you're trying to sail upwind, when you're trying to, when you're out of your comfort zone, that's when you can really innovate. And so I, I've seen it in my circle of friends, you know, folks who had talents I had no idea about saying, you know what? I was doing this for so many years, but I've always wanted to do this. So why not? Now's the time. I can do them. Right. I've decided that I value being able to stay at home with my kids and I can do this business. And I think if we do a little of this, little of that, we can make it work. Right. We've seen lots of people innovate in that way. And so the blessing to me of the pandemic, and that's not at all to make light of, of the significant amount of loss that our community has, has faced. 
But the blessing of it has been the disruption of status quo and pushing us out of our comfort zones to go seek those innovative solutions to make our livings, um, you know, and other things like that. Um, myself in my current position, pre-COVID, I probably would not have sought the job that I'm in now. You know, I live in Kona. Our office is in Honolulu. Uh, and so we're, mm. we're figuring out now how we're going to rework that um, as folks start returning to work, but it opened up this opportunity. And I think for a lot of folks, mm -hmm. we talked about that remote work. It's not just live in Hawaii, work for someplace on the continent, on the West Coast, East Coast, whatever. It's also just within Hawaii, right? Mm -hmm. Being able yeah. to access those opportunities. Yeah, that's very cool. I didn't know you were in Kona. That's very interesting. Yeah. So well, I, I guess benefit a lot of our neighbor island folks. So that's that's another thought. Um, so along those lines, Ilhia, what opportunities do you think are here now that maybe weren't here before for startups, entrepreneurs in the the whole of the you know innovation ecosystem, including tourism, of course, which is uh, your where you live in the day to day. It, but, it uh, is. Yeah. And not only do I, I live in it professionally day to day, but, you know, my community, for example, my street has 15 houses. Four of those houses, either in whole or in part, are short-term vacation rentals. They may use your service. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, sure hope so. Some of those folks also work <laughs> remotely, right? So there's, there's, I live in it professionally, and I also live in it, live in it, in my mm -hmm. neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 2019 was the first time Hawaii saw over 10 million visitors in a year. It's 10.4 million at the end of 2019, followed by just a rapid halt in March of 2020. And that disrupted the status quo, too. It caused folks to reexamine, you know, our community's relationship with tourism. You know, where is it welcome? Where is it not welcome? How do we set expectations for folks before they get here so that they behave in a way that's more appropriate for our community when they do get here? Mm -hmm. What are the ways that technology and innovation can be used to help us attract the kinds of visitors that we want to engage them in the kinds of experiences that are appropriate? Right? Those are some of the, I think, big opportunities for innovation in the visitor industry space is figuring out the answers to those questions. At the Tourism Authority, we've pivoted from, from being a marketing organization to now more destination management, branding, and visitor education, right? In response to the calls from the community to get a wrangle on this thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that pivot also provides a lot of opportunity for looking at different ways to do things. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I want to ask another on, same question. Yeah, go ahead, Asa. I think at least in Oahu, I don't know how it is in Hawaii Island, it seems like the very opposite of innovation. It seems like the local government wants to go back to the 80s, um, you know, and, and, and kind of ignore the reality of, of the changing world. Right. Um, Give us an example of stuff. What do you, what do you mean? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the, you know, the vacation mental, um, legislation that that is that is happening uh, in Honolulu and how it just completely ignores the way people travel um, and the kind of expectations people have from travel it kind of reminds me of like ski resorts like 20 years ago who like banned the snowboards because it was annoying them right um, those are annoying <laughs> <laughs> no, but 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 there's just like so many creative ways in which we can have it all. We can have vacation rentals, and we can have hotels, and we can have local communities that are undisrupted. But we just need to be a little creative. And it, and it seems like no one in in city hall is is thinking creatively, and it's kind of like an all or nothing approach. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it's just such a wasted opportunity. What do you think? I, I don't want to go too far down the uh, the Airbnb rabbit hole because I know it's this very controversial topic. But you know, what what would your creative solution be? I'm just curious. 
So my, my solution is this. We all say we want high value tourists, right? Yeah. That's what we all want. Just say minimum TAT of $50 a night mm -hmm. in vacation rentals, right? Mm -hmm. That's the equivalent of like a $500, $600 a night hotel, right? Without investing in a ton of um, infrastructure, without grabbing more land, without building new buildings, you just get this like just luxury uh, mm -hmm. tourists. And that would just weed out all the sort of like neighborhood houses that shouldn't be. Uh, mm -hmm. Least out. What you have right now is you have like My house. half of Kailua <laughs> and half of the North Shore, just empty, just empty houses of people who can afford to have an empty house, right? Mm -hmm. And just like, a, what do we have here that is important and is scarce as land? And we're just making this just unused resource that could be used to the community, right? That's like one creative solution. All right. Well, again, awesome. I don't I don't want to go too far down the, the Airbnb because we could spend all day talking about Airbnb. Can I say uh, one quick thing? Yes. OK, one real quick. OK, thing. I, I don't be quick. It's. I, I hear you, Asaf. I do. Um, it <laughs> kind of the bigger issue is between a year with eight million visitors and a year with 10 million visitors. We didn't really build any more hotels or anything like that. All right. So that growth happened in neighborhoods. So it's more about getting to a manageable level of visitors and what are the levers that we have. And when we talk about innovation in the space, you know, things like looking at reservations for really popular parks and trails, because yeah, there is a there is a limit. I don't know what the number is. You might not know what the number is. We don't know what the number is, but we know when too much is too much. Um, and so figuring out the systems to manage that better um, is an important thing, part of the work that we're looking at that I hope we get a chance to talk about later. And I will now back out of this rabbit hole. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. There, there needs to be a limit, uh, but there needs be, we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I was on the, uh, the DMAP uh, committee, uh, which is the... Um, kind of Oahu plan for, for tourism, right? And we talked a lot about this. We went down this rabbit hole, ad infinitum. But, um, you know, I do love the idea of the smart kind of management processes for, for all across the board in tourism. And I do think that's a big opportunity for our entrepreneurs, right? And I know we have some people on the call who are thinking about those solutions and coming up with those solutions. And that will make all of our lives better, the tourists and, and the residents, if we can figure out some smart management system. We certainly have the technology to make that happen. So and I, I hope we have a couple of minutes towards the end to circle back to that. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, so Ryan, what do you think? What are some opportunities out there now? You know, uh, the first thing that pops into mind, especially after, you know, this conversation, the discussion we just had, I mean, my fear is that uh, we had a near-death experience with COVID. We had the chaos brings opportunity cliche. We, and we did see record numbers of new businesses created. I was one of the people, obviously, who decided to jump off that cliff as well. Like when everything is scary, nothing is scary. Um, but actually, my fear is that, uh, as Asaf said, there's kind of a very strong uh, impetus and move to get back to the status quo we had. And so when you talk about what are the opportunities, my first thought is that, you know, um, I'm worried about the window already closing because of that kind of urgency to return. You know, I remember that in the darkest days of the uh, pandemic, it was all about economic diversification. It was all about um, what other things can we do? Where is our agriculture? Where is our energy? Where is our technology? Um, and now, although it's a good question, the conversation is back to how do we manage tourists uh, better? And I think that it clouds out sort of some of those really exciting conversations that we had previously. Um, but specifically focusing on, on opportunities. Um, one thing that I would mention is uh, if you look at Mana Up, you know, that, that accelerator, I think that their solution in a way is like, 
uh, if Hawaii is the resource, if the vibe and energy and love of Hawaii is what is in market demand, um, there are two ways to feed that market demand. You bring people to Hawaii and with all the good and bad that comes with that, or you bring Hawaii to them. And I'm very excited in this growth in the manufacturing sector, the, um, you know, even uh, whether it's mass production or even handcrafts and, and local crafts that uh, we're seeing the opportunity for someone to experience Hawaii by ordering a, you know, a gift box from, from a mana up cohort company of local jams and jellies and stuff. And maybe, you know, they will be happy with that and not necessarily want to come and sit on a beach. So uh, I do think that one of the things that happened after the pandemic that I think was a move in the right direction was more export from Hawaii, whether it was exporting products or exporting culture and community. Um, I think that that's, that's very exciting. Well, I will never have another thought in my head other than we should be exporting software, but I guess that's just me. Um, so <laughs> that's my bias, of course. That's what we started. I'll second that. Mm -hmm. I'll second that. I think, you know, I think jellies and everything is nice, but it's very low value add. Um, so we need to, you know, to focus on things that are high value add, which are, you know, experiences and tourism is high value add. Um, and I think also, you know, intellectual property be it software or patents or some things like that. Well, mm -hmm. sure, but a soft uh, a counter to software being what we export is that that is where we are on the same playing field as everybody else, right? And whether yes. it's you know, yeah. developers in India or develop, I mean, uh, my last job, we had developers in Ukraine, God mm -hmm. bless them, um, right? But that's that, my fear is that becomes a race to the bottom eventually in terms of uh, software as a, a form of plumbing rather than innovation, right? The reason however, why. However, I got to jump in here too, right? However, the intersect between our travel sector and our software sector, I think, is where the opportunity is. That's something that nobody else can replicate. So instead of our tourism industry simply being a service industry, it can be a source of innovation. Sure. You know, and we have seen that some of our companies that are the most successful are those that are innovating right here in the state and exporting with the push of a button, there's solutions in the, in the travel space. So that's kind of, you know, the, the connection point between the two, yeah. Oh, for sure. And another thing that adds value to Hawaii about, you know, the jams and the jellies and the whatever else, those physical exports, right? Software is important, absolutely. Software brings, you know, cash, that's important. But when we look at the, when we look at our, our complex needs, right? When we talk about food security, when we talk about food independence, right? If selling that jam and jelly allows those farmers to scale to where they can provide more food in Hawaii, then there's a value beyond the, you know, the dollar value to them engaging in that, you know, jam and jelly and whatever other products. In addition to like Ryan was saying, right? Hawaii is the lifestyle brand. Mm -hmm. So maybe now instead of coming every year, they come every two, three years mm -hmm. and they get their special boxes in between. But it's that, it's harnessing tourism's potential to drive diversification. Software is a part of that for sure. Tech is definitely a part of that. The jams mm -hmm. and the jellies to the extent that that can push food, important too. Yeah, absolutely. I think a great example is the Chaka Tea, right? Chaka Tea is a local brand of tea, which is delicious, but also, you know, has prompted an entire industry of growing mamaki on the Big Island, right, where it wasn't there before. So, you know, that's like a twofer, right? We're getting we're getting two businesses for one there. Certainly more sustainable agriculture is, is key, right. but I will, I, the other, the other thing in this, I don't want to focus too much on jams and jellies because yes, I agree with Asaf. It's like, that's a tiny thing. The fact that a farmer can feed his family is good. The fact that there is uh, productive use of land is good too. But the other part of it, the other entire angle that I wanted to focus on in terms of export uh, is entertainment. You know, I think that um, mm -hmm. again, whether it's our culture and whether you're talking about our indigenous culture specifically or just Hawaii's unique cosmopolitan culture, um, that's something that clearly has demand, whether it's Doogie Kamealoha or NCIS or who knows what, you know. Um, can the market be saturated? Absolutely. But is there a demand that uh, it, that we can meet and can drive 
um, economics here and drive jobs here because it's again something that can't exist somewhere else. I'm excited about that as well. Yeah, I, I agree actually that creative industries here I think are a huge uh, a potential for us. I mean, we're already doing quite a lot there. I think that doesn't maybe get all the attention that it deserves, but we can do even more. Somebody just put a comment that Bruno Mars is a great export. <laughs> I just have to say, yay, I love Bruno Mars. Um, all right, so my last question for the panel is, so where does all this lead us? Where are we 10 years from now? What does the startup scene look like? Um, you know, I don't know if we want to do best case, worst case, but just give us your, your thoughts, your thoughts on where we are in this startup scene. Uh, Asaf, we'll start with you. So, you know, I think a lot of this is already happening and, and it's sort of invisible where um, I don't think we're necessarily going to see like, you know, giant companies forming up here and kind of taking over downtown Honolulu. I don't think that's going to happen. But I think what we're going to see is um, a lot of people working remotely from the best place in the world because you want to be where, you know, the sun is always shining and the beach is beautiful and people are nice. And if you can be here, but have access to the opportunities all over the world, then I think this is kind of pe people are going to come from everywhere just to live their best life and also have kind of gainful employment all over the world remotely. Now, I don't know that you know, the people who currently live here are going to be the one with those jobs or people from the mainland coming here. I think the latter is probably more likely uh, that the people with, you know, the top skills and, and the education are just going to take advantage of their mobility and come here. And that's going to create kind of a concentration um, of people who are not necessarily working side by side, but that kind of osmosis is going to have a very positive effect um, I think on, on the ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we really have to be careful about there, right, is this further bifurcation of our communities, right, into, you know, kind of digital divide issues and the haves and have nots and that are, you know, the, the folks that are living in poverty will continue to not have those opportunities and people moving here from the mainland will continue to have those opportunities. So I think we have I to be really think, careful how this so bad. I think, I think, a lot of times what it takes to be successful as a role model mm -hmm. is knowing what's achievable, is knowing like yeah. what's possible and oh. being around people who, oh. who have done things, have made things, yeah. can show you the path. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think it's a zero sum mm -hmm. uh, game at all. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thought, Saf, because yeah, I've always thought, uh, you know, part of what we don't have are those those models, right? Those examples of the guy that took his company public and now, you know, he's able to give back to the community, he's able to do all these things and uh, that kind of virtuous cycle, which we don't get to see a lot of here, um, you know, that kind of success, that kind of outsized success um, from from going it alone and doing your your own your startup and your entrepreneurship and all that stuff. So yeah, more of that I think would be great. Um, all right, Ryan, to you, what, what does the startup scene here look like in the future? Well, future is easy. 10 years is nigh unto impossible. I mean, the whole world came <laughs> three yeah, years ago. Six months from now. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, you know, 10 years ago, we were talking Windows Phone and uh, Nexus 7 and all of that. I mean, the Nook was still a big deal. So it's a long time. Um, I was wondering if this conversation was going to get into things like blockchain and all of that and Bitcoin. But uh, what my answer would be the number one takeaway for the future, and I think Asaf said it better than anyone or than I will be able to say, the thing that I would take away is decentralization, decentralization of everything. Lo location is irrelevant in many respects. Um, and that, as the following conversation showed, is a good and a bad thing. I mean, the fact of the matter is people can choose to come, well, more and more people may choose to come here um, and that may displace people and that may in, uh, endanger our indigenous culture. And so we have to be careful about it and thoughtful about it, but I don't see it as the end of the world. And I personally don't think that, you know, if your objective is 
nobody should ever move here ever, that is not sustainable either. I mean, we've had a net loss in Hawaii for for uh, for years and years and years, and we're one of the few states that lose people. So even if you think that it's because all of the Mark Zuckerbergs of the world are moving here, um, it still doesn't offset um, the need for entire communities, the need for uh, human capital and stuff. So I think, you know, we're in a very special place. Um, I would, I'm glad that we're Hawaii and not Detroit. So I'm very excited um, by de decentralization and how we can um, make the best use, the smartest use of our natural resources and our human resources. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. All right. Elihia, what are your thoughts on the future here? 10 years on one hand seems like a blink of an eye. Um, in some respects, 10 years feels like it's gonna take that long to get a building permit, <laughs> right? It, it, <laughs> It really depends. I have a, I have a three and a half year old daughter. She's going to be four in July, 10 years, she's going to be 14. So I think a lot of what's emerging is going to be from what our kids have experienced over the past two years of the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? They've had a little bit of regular school and kind of those traditional conventional ways of learning. And then they spent two years online. They spent two years knowing that they could access all this information in the world from their living room or from auntie's house or from you know grandpa's garage or whatever right so i think that's gonna shift a lot i, I i'm fascinating by what i see in the schools with media with robotics with things like that right so the kids who are gonna be young adults in 10 years are gonna start so far ahead mm -hmm of you know where i started at that same age that's one thing another thing is in 10 years our climate's going to be markedly different and i think that the pressure we feel today to solve some of those things is going to be so much more intense and I wholeheartedly think that Hawaii is the place where we will figure out a lot of that stuff, either by looking backwards towards our ancestral knowledge and some of those, um, you know, historic ways of doing things, looking forward and just the, the scale of things here is such that you can innovate really quickly, mm. right? I'm, this is going to sound really biased towards Hawaii Island, but with the diversity of climate zones and renewable energy resources and all of that stuff, you can innovate really quick with, uh, environmental solutions here um, all across Hawaii though, right? Mm -hmm. There's yeah. the space, there's the spirit, there's the need, there's the pressure to figure this out. Um, Cause if we don't, we're gonna be living underwater pretty soon. <laughs> yep, that is very true. I do think the interesting thing about the pandemic is it did kind of fast forward a lot of these trends like, you know, remote learning and remote working and all of that like really condensed time. Absolutely. Um, so that's that's a you know brings a whole new opportunity set as well, right? So we'll see where where things end up from there. Um, I want to open it up to our audience for questions. So if you have a question and you're feeling brave, you can raise your hand and I'll call on you. If you're feeling a little less brave, you can put it in the Q and A function. Um, I see that we have a question in Q and A already from Aram Armstrong. Um, this one looks like also a good one for you, Elihia. Can you see the question? Um, yes. Yeah. So building on technology uh, to address managed tourism, how can culture, stories, and media be a force in shaping expectations? What are your thoughts on thanks, that? Thanks for the question. That's a good one. So uh, 2018, um, the, the main campaign to promote the Hawaiian Islands as a visitor destination was a campaign called Hawaii Rooted. And for the first time in that world of things, rather than talking about how much fun you can have when you come here, it talked about who's here, what we do, the kinds of values that are important. Um, Hawaii Rooted was followed up by you know, a few other campaigns. The current one is called Malama Hawaii, where we look at folks who are actively doing things to steward either a place or an environment or a cultural practice. 
And that is our that is our primary campaign as we brand Hawaii to the world. Paired along with that is visitor education about how to act in the ocean, how to not touch turtles and seals and things like that, right? Looking at um, how to how to hike responsibly, you know, look for the marked trails, don't go climb over fences and stuff. If you have to sneak around the sign, that's probably not a place you should be hiking. Things like that. Right, and that's all baked into our our main communications to potential visitors in their home markets and following them along as they get here. Um, you know, I know I know the Blue Startups Ohana is really proud of Volta. Um, they recently announced that they're going to be sharing some of our Malam Hawaii messaging on their charging stations. That's really exciting. There are other technologies where we're looking at how to get that message in front of visitors in a very very targeted, very strategic manner. Uh, we're going to be rolling out some new stuff at the airport soon um, and so on. So there, there's lots of tech stuff in that. Um, I don't want to steal all the air here, but a little bit later, I can talk about our conceptual big dream platform. Let's all do a right. lot of that stuff. Big dream platform. Sounds good. All right. So uh, next question from the audience from John Coco. Hi, Lo, I don't, I'm probably mispronouncing that. What East West, Asia and US competitive advantages does Hawaii have? Have companies leveraged this? Um, of course, this is something that we have spent a lot of time thinking about and talking about at Blue Startups, but I wanna give my panel a chance to answer. Thoughts on that? Maybe Ryan or Asaf? I think you're the subject matter expert. Um, <laughs> I mean, since I was a kid in the 70s, I've been hearing, we're the perfect spot between Asia and Hawaii. Well, you know, what does that mean? So tell us, Shanoa. Well, um, I, of course, I still am bullish on this opportunity. And yes, I agree, Brian. We've been giving it lip service for a long time here in the state, right? We've been kind of saying this, and it hasn't really been true. Um, Blue Starps has tried to make it more of a reality. We have the East Meets West Conference every year that we've been putting on for now eight years. We have big network in Asia. Um, and I do think we're a great potential place for folks to headquarter if they're doing work in both places. You know, for example, Blue Startups partner uh, company is the Tetris company. If you didn't know that, Tetris is located right here in Honolulu. And the reason they're located here is because they're an East-West company. Their two biggest customer bases are the U.S. And, and Asia. So it made sense for them to be here. I think it makes sense for a lot of folks to be here. Um, now, what has happened in the last two years is that dream has definitely been put on hold. People can't even get in and out of here from Asia. So, you know, we'll have to kind of wait and see what happens with all of the Asia ecosystem, I think, when things come back, back online, so to speak, there and people can travel again and get on planes again from in and out of Asia. So uh, right now, really an open question, I think, in terms of how that plays into Hawaii's future. Yeah, so that would be my answer. Mm -hmm. All right, so next question is for Asaf. Um, let's see, uh, will paying someone to clean a property still make sense if the host in Airbnb knowingly that there is a small margin in Airbnb rentals? Well, that's a very specific question. I, I think we can probably skip that. That one, Asaf, yes, it makes sense to pay your, your cleaners, I, right? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't really understand the question. But, okay. uh, you, can, you can reach out to me privately. Yeah, yeah. Can, yeah, uh, directly uh, ask Asaf that one. Okay, um, Robert Buchanan asks, can you talk about Hawaii and the possibility for startups in this program to be involved in hardware manufacturing? Leveraging Hawaii as a small hardware manufacturing hub or distribution um, and look to import from Asia. Does Hawaii have a program for this, uh, et cetera, et cetera? You can read the rest. Who has a comment for that? Maybe Ryan, you were talking about manufacturing a little bit. Sure. I This is not my space, so I don't know much about it. Um, I, oh, I would like to hear Asaf's thoughts, so I'll just say very quickly, you know, when I, we were in Blue Startups, we started as a hardware startup. We thought, oh, we're going to take this off-the-shelf stuff, we're going to add our software to it, and it's going to be great. Um, but, you know, the margins are so tough, and the manufacturing is so um, specific, uh, whether you're talking out of Asia or even out of Europe, where a lot of the ag tech hardware is coming out of now. Um, because even for shipping, airplanes fly over Hawaii without thinking twice. I really don't think that there's 
you know, any hard advantage to doing something like that in Hawaii. But um, Asaf, what do you think? I, I second what you're saying. I don't think that uh, there is any advantage, but I also don't think that there is any disadvantage. I think if you have an idea that involves hardware, you're going to have to work with probably an Asian manufacturer, even if you are in the mainland, right? So if your idea is good, um, you now have access to capital all over the world. You just happen to live here, right? It doesn't make it doesn't make it any harder or easier uh, to be here. So um, that's my take. Yeah, your inventory might not even touch Hawaii. <laughs> right, like you, you're going to contract it out from Asia, and then you're going to have it shipped to a warehouse in Kentucky, where it's going to be delivered through UPS. It doesn't even have to touch. Um, but you know, if the IP is here. Um, and the company is here, then the value is here. It doesn't really matter where the goods are being uh, manufactured or sold. I mean, this is this is the beautiful thing about the world we live in right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's like uh, you know your iPhone, which says designed in California, but certainly wasn't built there, right? Yes, so, <laughs> so uh, we can design all kinds of things here, I think, but uh, building them here gets economically difficult. Um, okay, next question. Uh, so one of our uh, audience members asks, what is the one thing webinar participants, perhaps they're not here in Hawaii, uh, can help with startups in Hawaii? So uh, I get this question a lot at Blue Startups. We have a lot of great kama'aina out there all over the world, the, the Hawaii diaspora, strong and well, um, who wants to contribute. How can they contribute to the startup scene here? Invest. Invest. Give us your money. <laughs> <laughs> Other thoughts? Investing is good. Using their products is good. Like there are, there are whether it's Airbnb for the for the vacation rental market, or um, I mean, there are platforms. I'm I'm suddenly blanking, but certainly uh, Blue Startups has um, fostered a number of them that are you know trying to make uh, make it in a crowded space and using their platform certainly helps but i think when you're talking about the biggest gap in the pipeline for hawaii startups it really is in the funding space it really is that follow on funding after the seed funding so if you happen to be someone who has who who happened to get in to bitcoin at 37 cents you know why don't uh, you share some of that uh, and invest in some white company <laughs> that sounds good. The other thing you can always do if you're a subject matter expert is volunteer at Blue Startups or many of the other accelerators as mentors. So um, I know all of the accelerators have mentor networks and a lot of those folks are leveraging people that aren't living here. They are living elsewhere, but they care about Hawaii and they want to give back. And that's one way you can do it. Um, uh, next question from see Maria ask what are the biggest barriers to the neighbor islands um, taking advantage of innovation acceleration entrepreneurship in the state and how are we trying to support the neighbor islands uh, in this industry um Elihia, do you want to take that one since you're our, our big island rep here oh thanks for the question Maria I, what are the biggest barriers um Hmm. I think it really depends on what kind of space you're in um, with your innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, certainly there's, and Chanel, I'd, I'd love to hear how you, you guys support neighbor island participants in, in your cohorts and programs. I know a lot of, there are a lot of programs, cohorts, things like that, that happen on Oahu. Um, and so sometimes the barrier is traveling to participate in those or participating in a remote fashion that perhaps is not as, um, you know, doesn't fulfill all the, the ways one could be participating in something like that. I do think there are opportunities too, to being, you know, far away. Uh, if I was gonna try to be like Ryan, I wouldn't wanna try to be like Ryan in Ryan's neighborhood, right? But I can't be the Hawaii Island, Ryan. <laughs> Don't worry, Brian. I'm not, I'm not trying to do that, but oh, I would like that, okay. right? So this... be bad for Hawaii if there were more of me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Soak up all the broadband. Um, but I think there are opportunities to certainly with this island in particular. I'm always going to be a cheerleader, right? Just the 
the inspiration that seems to flow, the creative, the island itself is creative, right? There's more island every day. Mm -hmm. The island itself is creative. Um, so there's that energy thing. I, you know, I, one thing that I don't, I've wondered this a lot. I haven't actually had to go look for funding for anything to really start cracking down on this, but there's a lot of private wealth that could potentially be investors um, on every island. Hawaii Island in particular. I mean, if you look at Kona Airport between Christmas and New Year's, sure park your jet. Right, right. Try. Yeah. Try. Right, and I we, keep, we see these pockets on that. Hawaii, Hawaii as well. What's that? I keep saying that. I just need like $10 million from each of those guys. And then I'm going to have a $100 million to 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 invest in this industry. <laughs> and that's a rounding error, right. guys, you know? And it's one of those things that we have to build those relationships with yeah. those folks, right? But there are lots of, these are folks who have chosen, you know, Asaf, like you said, right? These people have chosen this place to make their home for mm -hmm. a reason. Mm -hmm. So what are those reasons and how do we engage uh, more deeply uh, with our neighbors? So I think that's an opportunity. Um, and I have gone so far away from your question, Maria, my apologies, but yeah, I think it's just the kind of the logistics of participating in programs that can be really supportive. Yeah. Probably my thought. Ilihi, I like what you said about the Kona airport. I think the same thing too, you know, they're here, but they're not here. Um, on, you know, Mark Zuckerberg gets a lot of grief and he deserves a significant portion of it. But I mean, at least I see him trying to um, participate in his community and invest in community and stuff. I mean, whether or not that offsets all the horrible things he does is up to you to decide. But there are a lot there are a lot of people here who are not engaged. But if I were going to be flippant, uh, what are the biggest barriers to the neighbor islands? Um, one of the biggest barriers is Oahu uh, in the sense that you know, like my background is in journalism. All my friends work at the local media outlets. Um, you never, I mean, it's so it's so Honolulu centric. A lot of things are Honolulu centric, and it's not that we're biased against the neighbor islands. We just don't even think about them. And I think that's really one of the one of the challenges. You know, unless a dam breaks on Kauai or the volcano erupts on the Big Island, you know, when are we gonna when are we gonna hear about that? Um, that's why I liked, uh, you know, like the Travel to Change um, Accelerator, their current cohort, they decided to do everyone but Oahu. They picked companies, they went with a full neighbor island um, cohort. And I think, you know, making an effort like that um, from the part of people in Oahu is one of uh, something that we can definitely do. I mean, I think even without active participation of, you know, of those like billionaires who move here, they just they pay taxes here. Right, that that flows to the local economy, whether they're you know giving or not, is just they're taxed. They live here, they get taxed, and I think that you know that that helps the, the community um, kind of in, in an implicit way without someone kind of like you know uh, building a building or or making a park. This just goes into you know the resources of the community, and it's not something that you know, they get credit for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, well, I would like to say just one more quick thing that a lot of those folks who have chosen Hawaii as their home and, and they're a little wealthier, they, many of them do contribute to the community in meaningful ways. They do it really quietly and you never hear about it. Um, so, so what I'm talking about is my comments are strictly limited to actively participating in the innovation ecosystem and kind of making investments there. They definitely do make contributions, you know, through whether that's through taxes or through charitable giving. I think that happens. Um, it's not very public. And, you know, wherever people interact with each other, they're going to be involved and they're going to, you know, eventually invest people invest like where they see opportunity and they see opportunity usually where they are so mm -hmm. um i think it will happen i think it's happening but it's just not something that's easily you can easily track right yeah i'm sure that's true it's just i, I i'm not seeing the money directly so therefore i think it's not happening <laughs> <laughs> but yes it probably is and i know a lot of people are working on trying to engage those folks. And, you know, I think it's on all of us to engage 
um, yeah, all the new newbies to our community and not just the billionaires, right? I mean, this is, right. you know, the Movers and Shakas program is about kind of engaging people that are moving back home and, or uh, moving here for the first time so that they do get involved. And, you know, what we know is that if you get involved, you're more likely to stay and more likely to contribute, more likely to be an economic contributor as well. And if you don't, then you're in and out and, you know, we've, we've got nothing to show for it, so to speak. Um, Okay, last chance to get your questions in here. Um, I'm trying to read real quickly what we have uh, in the questions. Any of my panelists see something that jumps out that they want to talk to in the Q&A? Kevin asks about uh, STEM education. I think that's an easy yes, but I also think that, again, I'm sort of shifting from the mindset that every kid should know how to code or even every kid should understand computational thinking. And um, again, because of the fact that these are things that are being taught in schools around the world at probably greater intensities than they're being taught in the United States, let alone Hawaii, is that um, I've become more and more interested in, as I think Shinoa has mentioned, and the creative industry side, the things that are, are even harder to hopefully for some point uh, automate or replace with robots um, is, uh, is my focus too. So if not more STEM education, maybe more um, digital media uh, education, um, creator education and things like that. Yeah, and that's a great point. I mean, especially in the industry of Technology and coding and all of that is becoming commoditized. Uh, while it's good to, to know it and understand it, the future seems to be headed in that direction where that's that's going to be a skill set that is fairly replaceable, right? And we're trying to create skill sets that aren't. Um, creative industries definitely would be one of them. Um, I'm trying to look scan here through the other questions. Just to uh, add to that real quick. Yeah. There's. I think the STEM education is absolutely important. All the creative industry education, super important. The value that you're gonna apply all those skill sets to probably the most important, mm -hmm. right? So when we think about, you know, at HTA, our, our kind of operating principle right now is malama kuuhome, caring for our island home, right? So that value of malama, what can you, how can you advance malama with your STEM education? How can you advance Malama with your creative work? How can you advance Malama through your innovation? Right, Ryan, mahalo for bringing up the Travel to Change and Native Hawaiian Hospitality Association partnership to, to help community stewardship organizations kind of build their capacity to accept visitor volunteers to go actively engage in Malama projects, right? To go care for that fish pond or that that reforestation project or whatever the case may be, right? If it's STEM and you're figuring out some new way to fix some problem that's plaguing some community, that's Malama with the power of STEM behind it, with the power of creative, with the power of innovation. Um, those are the kind of bridges that I think are unique to Hawaii that we can build. I think that mindset is one of the things we can export. You know, jams, jellies, cool, software, awesome. That that mindset that we need to malam our place and how to connect those dots, I think is probably our most valuable export. Awesome. My, I don't my, think my anybody can say it this, better. <laughs> um, I, on, you know, in education and STEM, I think, you know, the conditions that are required for innovation, like require some understanding of STEM, some understanding of, of business, but the most important thing is risk taking and, being able like put that into your um kind of um into your mind sort of not being always thinking about a, a job thinking about how am i going to take risks and create opportunities for myself and i think that's i don't know how that can be taught um you know in school but i think that's is something that is sometimes missing uh, mm -hmm. for a lot of people just being, being able to take, you know, personal risks in order to, to, to achieve things. Mm -hmm. Well, I, that's, uh, I think the answer to that is very long, but includes mm -hmm. kind of some of the economic realities of, of living here, right? That um, risks are hard in an economy yeah. that punishes you for, for taking them uh, often. So I think that that has to be part of it. But 
you know, coming back to, I absolutely love what Elihi was saying about Malama. And I think that's really important and important for us to know that we are just as competitive and just as smart and just as innovative as anyone in the world. And that in many ways, I think we're better problem solvers for some of the challenges that we have. And also that we are have the ability to see and solve problems that many other folks don't. Uh, I, I like to think of Hawaii entrepreneurs as solving real problems as opposed to maybe fictitious ones that are solved in other parts of the world that are serving the 1%. Um, so I really like that part of our ecosystem. I think it is unique to our startup scene here. Um, you know, and I really appreciate all the entrepreneurs and all the other folks that tuned in today. And we will wrap it up there. Thank you to our panel, Asaf, Elikia, and Ryan. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for tuning in today. Um, and just uh, another reminder, Blue Startups is recruiting for cohort 14. You can apply online. Bluestartups.com is the best place to find that application link. Uh, I am easy to find. I'm on LinkedIn. I do respond. If you want to reach out to me personally, please do. Um, and again, thanks for tuning in, everybody. Aloha. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh,